left off last week. We didn't get very far last week, so I told Miss Katie I panicked several times this week uh, when I started looking at the lesson and, and what I had prepared and started looking at the pictures and the slides and, and, and nearly panicked that I didn't have any new stuff on there and then realized I didn't finish it, so it was, so it was okay. Remember, we're in the Abrahamic age. Uh, we're looking through that. We talked about the calling and the covenant with Abraham. That covenant being the, the first promise, uh, or not the first promise, but the promise to Abraham about uh, the relationship that God had established with Abraham and that he was going to, to continue to progress through uh, his children. And he would make a great nation out of them. Uh, we talked about Ishmael and Isaac, uh, the sons of Abraham. Remember with Ishmael and Isaac, uh, both. God made a great nation out of both of those boys. Uh, and, and, but yet, God chose Isaac uh, to, to bring forth Messiah. And remember, we talked, or we kept bringing up this idea of God rejecting the first and, and accepting the second. And that's just a theme that keeps, keeps repeating. Again, here's Esau and Jacob. And we saw the same thing there, uh, where, where Jacob was chosen uh, and for, to, to, to bring forth Messiah. Uh, we talked a little bit about the transition with Jacob, how he started off as Jacob the trickster, and then he became Israel. Uh, ha having power with God is, is basically uh, the, the idea of the, the name Israel. Uh, so there was a transition. We talked about that a little bit last week. Uh, so we started talking about Israel and the 12 sons. Last week we went through that transition, uh, that encounter with God that, that, uh, that Jacob had. Uh, which is the transition from the supplanter, the trickster, uh, the fleshly nature, and we find that submission to God, and the name change to Israel, uh, and then what God continues to do with him. And then we started talking about the, the, the boys. Uh, let's see where I'm at. Let me make sure we get, I didn't want to go over a whole lot of this. Oh, I am well. Hold on, let me get back where I need to back. Oh. Looks like I got the right one. If not, we're supposed to be a short class. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. Here's where we talked about the, 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 the conversion of, of Jacob. Uh, and we talked about the going from Jacob to, to being Israel, prevailing with God or having power with God, uh, and the encounter that we had there. Um, and we'll move on. All right. We talked about the introduction of the boys. Uh, here, here they are. Look at them. Uh, that was, a, that was. A, I thought that was a good picture. Uh, you know what? Oh yeah, I used to be in Yeah, I couldn't get on with them. All right. For some reason I don't think I'm in the right place. But we'll just jump in here and do it anyway. All right. So we talked about first of all, we talked about the son who was crushed. Now last week we started dealing with just the individual sons of Israel. Uh, we talked about the son who was crushed, of course, which this was Reuben. So we're going to pick up and we'll start reading again in, in Genesis 49. Some folks refer to Genesis 49 as the judgment seat of Jacob. And you find, uh, we'll start in verse 1, uh, and, and you'll find that the statement here that's made about Jacob talking to his boys. It says this, and Jacob called unto his, unto him, unto, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. So in chapter 49, we find the blessing of Jacob to all of his children. And, and there's several different aspects, as we see in biblical prophecy. There's several talks about uh, what's going to be a prophetic revelation about not only that son, but that nation, that, that tribe of Israel from this point forward. There are three areas that you can look, and we may talk about that a little more as we go through. Uh, you, you can look in Genesis 49, and this is the blessing. Then you can look in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 34, uh, and you, you see a blessing of Moses then, and he talks about each one of the tribes then. Uh, and then you can go to Revelation, uh, and you can see uh, the ending of all of that. And we'll see some of that as we go through. Just some of the neat uh, aspects of this and how, how it's all put together when you start kind of looking through it. All right. 
We're going to move now to the next one. And we, and we dealt with Reuben last week, so we're not going to go through all that again. We'll go ahead and read it again. Look at verse 3. He said, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. And we talked about last week that, that he reminds him uh, about what he could have had. As firstborn, this should have been what he received. But in verse 4 he said, Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Because thou wentest up uh, to thy father's bed, thou defilest, then defilest thou it. Uh, he went up to my couch, and there was a, a, an adulterous sin that took place, that, and, and we see a, a transition in the life of Reuben. Uh, and he lost those three things that God said should have been his. The birthright should have been his. Uh, the uh, priesthood of the, uh, of the family should have been his. Uh, and then also the double portion of the goods uh, should have gone to Reuben. Uh, and we'll, we'll find as we go through that the priesthood, where did the priesthood go? Levi. Levi. Right, that's, that's, that's an easy one. The priesthood went to Levi. Uh, we find the uh, birthright goes to Judah. Uh, and through whom Messiah would come. Uh, and then the double portion goes to Joseph. Uh, and you'll find uh, in this listing, uh, you'll find a different listing of the 12 sons. Then you get into Deuteronomy and the 12 tribes. And the Revelation, you'll find a little bit different because uh, you're going to find uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, which are the two sons of Joseph <laughs> that are listed. And that's the double portion that Joseph received uh, through, because of the... the the sin of Reuben. All right, that catches us all up. We're talking about now. Number two, the sons who were condemned. The sons who were condemned. All right, and, and we're dealing again. We're dealing with this. We're trying not to make this a history lesson. But what we want to do is we want to take application from what happened with these boys and understand that there are consequences to what we do. God gives opportunity, and, and some we know a lot more about, some we know very little. Uh, but we'll, we'll deal with that as we go. All right. So we're going to talk about Simeon and Levi. Look at verse 5 of Genesis 49. It says, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are, are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they digged down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. All right, so we start looking at these two, these two boys that were condemned. We need to understand and get a, a, a working of, of what's going on here. As we look at the names, we understand that they always mean something. Uh, so Simeon literally means the idea of hearing and we went back and we started trying to look at this a little bit differently. Um, we talked about Reuben. Reuben meant behold a son. And you always have to look at this in light of when mom names these boys, what's going on, right? So you remember we talked a couple of weeks ago about the wives of Jacob uh, and, and how the boys were, 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 were born. And, and we had, I always get this wrong. Uh, you had Leah. And then you had her handmaid, uh, was it Zilpah, was her handmaid? I, and then, see, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the Bible, the Bible class scholar, uh, scholars here trying to help me out. Uh, and then you had Rachel, uh, and then you had Bilhah, which was her handmaid. So you had the four ladies, uh, and then you had the, the sons from them. Reuben was the first one. She was the son, he was the son of Leah. And Leah named him Reuben. Behold a son, because Leah's thinking that now she's got, she, she's making uh, an impression on, Jew, on Jacob or Israel. Now she's giving him a son. That was a big thing in Bible days. Behold a son. She was all excited about that. Well, things didn't change a whole lot. So Simeon comes along, uh, and she, she names him, uh, his name means hearing. And I'm going to read the verse. It's Genesis 29, verse 33. Just listen. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. She called his name Simeon. Because the Lord had heard her. Simeon means hearing. All right, so she, again, she's thinking, 
boy, the Lord is really blessing, and, and this is going to make a difference with my with my husband. Uh, and, and then Levi comes along, uh, and, and Levi, then his name means joined. All right, and I'll give you the verse. Genesis 29, verse 34. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. And, you know, so you kind of see the, the progress with mom uh, and what's going on and what their names mean. Now it's gonna, it's also going to carry throughout their life, but, but that gives us a start. These two boys, number one, uh, we, we see them as the hot-headed pair. Well, the hot-headed pair. It's interesting, these are the only two boys in this judgment seat of Jacob that are, that are dealt with together. Simeon and Levi. The, the, my daddy used to say this. He used to say, one boy's a boy, two, boy, two boys is half a boy, and three boys ain't no boy at all. Now, if you, just think about that, probably we'll say it again. One boy's a boy, two boys is half a boy, and three boys ain't no boy at all. And the idea is you get two or three boys together, they ain't going to tell them what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, because invariably one of them is going to say, I double dog dare you. And you know, you can't, you, you, know, you just can't put down a double dog dare. I mean, you know, that's just, <coughs> that's just boys. All right? <laughs> These two boys were not good for each other. And they're dealt with together because in their sin together, there were some major problems. So number one, we see them as the hot-headed pair. All right? Uh, and notice he said in verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. Number one, it talks about their anger. In their anger, they killed a man. What are they referring to? If you don't have time, if you'll go back and we'll study the history of these two boys, there was something that happened in, in their history. Their sister, Dinah, uh, was, was uh, I need to say that. Miss Dinah was raped by a, a, a fellow there in, in the area uh, that really felt like he loved her and wanted to marry her. And you understand that the statements of the Lord that we've already read about them not marrying outside the, the, the their, uh, I hate to say race, but uh, outside the parameters that God had put for, for basic reasons of religious purity is what they were after. And so the gentleman wanted to marry Dinah and they, they and he took her into just a bad situation. Well, Simeon and Levi decided they would get revenge for their sister. And through some deception and through some cruelty, <laughs> try to be careful, you go back and read the story. Um, they lied to this whole this whole city, uh, and they make a deal with them and, and tell them if you'll do this one thing that we'll we'll give you our daughters and we'll take your daughters and we'll do all this and and well, there ain't no reason but just to say what they did. Uh, they told them they said if you'll be circumcised like we are, uh, then then we'll we'll make this deal. Well, the Bible talks about the fact that after they they all agreed, and after they did that, here's the Bible word. I'm just going to use the way the Bible says it. The Bible says, while they were still sore, Simeon and Levi go in and kill everybody. Everybody. Kill all the males, all of that. Take some of the, the, the children uh, captive. Uh, but they just it, it destroy the whole city. So it talks about in their anger, they killed a man. Uh, and in their self, now here, there's the whole point. In their self-will, they dig down a wall. They destroyed that whole city. And, and God talked about that. <laughs> In verse number seven, when he said, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce. And their wrath, for it was cruel. And, and the idea is they went above and beyond what was needed, necessary, or proper. Again, I'll go back to one boy is a boy, two boys is half a boy, three boys ain't no boy at all. In the flesh, they just they, they went way beyond what they and, and there's the that's the whole key right there. In their self-will. Okay? They did, even with their anger, if they would have stopped and checked with the Lord, they could have gotten an answer for that. But in their self-will, I guess the lesson for this morning is going to be this. We have got to check our will. Because sometimes what we think and what we want doesn't match up with what God says is proper and right and necessary. 
Now we've got to adjust our will and make sure we're following what God wants us to do. So in their anger, they killed a man. In their self-will, they dig down a wall. Uh, so God is pronouncing judgment upon them. Uh, and the curse of the Father is this. Now this is interesting as you start looking at this. They're going to be cursed. And God's going to do something in their, in their tribes, in their, in their families. But understand, failure is not final. And, and, and a, a, what a huge lesson we've got here. Because we're going to find this. He says in, in verse 7... He said, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. If you'll study the history of Simeon, what you'll find with Simeon is, Simeon never really conquers the land like God did. He never got his inheritance. He never got his portion like he should have. And if you'll study the, the, the tribe of Simeon, what you're going to find is they are dispersed throughout the other tribes of Israel. They're living in the land. Some are living in the land of, uh, of Judah. Some are living in the land, you know, we could go through all the rest of the boys. And, and they're, li they're scattered throughout Jacob, just like God said, because of sin in their life. Now, what happens to, to, to the tribe of Levi? See, I don't know. I don't understand if, if Simeon never repented or, or Simeon, I, I don't, I don't. But, but I see this because God never really used them. But who was Levi? Levi were the priests. Now we find that God does exactly what he says here because the Levites also did not get an inheritance in the land but they, were, but they were scattered throughout the tribes of Israel. Now, they were serving God and they were the priests and, and they had cities all throughout Israel. So they were doing things for the Lord. They were serving God. But yet this prophecy was, was fulfilled even in them serving God. So we find a distinction between Simeon and Levi. I, I don't know. I don't have an answer about Simeon. I don't know exactly what happened there, uh, why God never used them. But I see that God did use Levi even in that scattering that he promised would come to him. So we see these two boys, Simeon and Levi, these two tribes. Uh, they were very hot-headed. Uh, they were self-willed. Uh, and it caused a curse upon them. Uh, they were separated and, and really never saw fulfillment of, of the original promise that was given to, 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 to Abraham. All right, so we see kind of how that worked with those two. All right, so we'll move on. Uh, I think we will to the next one. <clears throat> Number three, we'll talk about the son who was crowned. The son who was crowned. Some of these will take a little longer than the others. We'll get through this one and they on the fly. All right, the son who was crowned. Now, this is Judah. This, this will be Judah. So look at verse number 8. Uh, we'll start with verse 8 and start looking at, at Judah. He says this, Judah, thou art he whom my brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the, uh, in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art going up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his fold under the vine, his ass, ass his colt under the choice vine, and washed his garment in wine, his clothes in the blood of, the, of grapes, his eyes shall be red with wine and his, and his teeth white with milk. So, so we begin to see the blessings on Judah. Now remember, Judah is going to receive the birthright. So, so Judah is receiving this uh, uh, messianic promise that Messiah is going to come through him. Uh, and it's going to Judah. Uh, why? Why did it go to Judah? Because God chose it. That, that's, because God said that's where it's going to come from. I, I don't know all the details of that. All we know is that God said this is what was going to happen. 
We find his name means praise of the Lord. Let's go back and let me read uh, about Mama. Uh, Genesis 29, verse 35, and she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left barren. Again, this is Leah. Uh, she's bearing the, the fourth son. Uh, his name is Judah. Uh, she said, I will praise the Lord. And that's exactly what his name means. Now, we read the very first part of that where it said, uh, that his brethren would praise him. Now, we're, we're beginning to look at a, a specific messianic prophecy, a prophecy about the coming of Messiah, and this reference about his brethren praising him deals with this idea of this is where Messiah is going to come. Uh, it it's it's vo means voiced gratitude. It's just a, uh, an uplifting of praise toward him. Uh, and, and he says that, thy brethren shall praise all right, uh, so, so we see a great praise that takes place with him. And again, it's a prophecy of, of Messiah's coming. Uh, his conquest, we find that he is of great strength. Uh, he talks about thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Judah, the lion, uh, we'll find that he, he brings about some ultimate victory. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in just a minute. Uh, his position and, and what God does through him and, and how God places. God really gives Judah that place of prominence in the tribes of Israel. Now when you start looking, matter of fact, when, when things start going south, uh, if you will, or when things start going bad, you're going to have two tribes that the kingdom's going to split, uh, and you're going to have two kingdoms. You're going to have the kingdom of Israel, and you're going to have the kingdom of Judah. All right? So, so you see how, how Judah plays a very prominent role uh, in the history of Israel. Of Israel. His preeminence is marked by several things. And, and we can go through and read all of these now. We read them already. About the father's children shall be bow down before thee. The lions whelp, and uh, from thy prey they've gone up. And he stood, you know, and, well, just, just look at this. There's, the preeminence is found in several aspects of the life of Judah. Number one, he is first in number. Judah became the largest tribe. He became the tribe that was usually mentioned first Judah All right we find that he was first in territory he had the largest territory in the nation when they go into the promised land and they take the, the promised land Judah is the one that has the most of course he has the largest number therefore he gets the most land and if you look that's how, that's how it was divided up the size of the tribe uh, determined uh, how much territory they received. He was first in the marching order. When God gives the marching orders, it was Judah that went first. It was Judah that led them. It was Judah that went before them. All right? Just that place of promise God's giving this nation. Why? Is not this a picture of the coming of Messiah, their leader? All right? Messiah is coming through this nation. It's first in prowess, first in battle. And a lot of the great men of war, you'll read through the Old Testament, came from the nation of Judah. They were, they were just great warriors. He talks about that's that, that idea of the lion's wealth and, and just the strength of that young lion that came up. So all of these aspects of the preeminence of the nation, they were first in war when they went out to war. Many times it was Judah that went first and went before them. Was there, uh, was the, the, the uh, to, to use this phrase, I heard it again this week, but to use this phrase, the tip of the spear, that was Judah as they went to, went to war. And then we find his, his regal dignity, his dignity that's pronounced upon him when you get to verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Shiloh deals with Christ, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So, so we find his, his royal dignity that's there. Judah, the birthright, passes to him. He finds that place of prominence. And, and we use the word preeminence on purpose because it points us directly to Christ. And, and we see in Judah uh, all the Messiah coming, and we see the picture of him being first, and we see the picture of him uh, being uh, uh, 
the conqueror that's going to come and eventually with the nation bring about victory and set up the kingdom of God. And, and we see all the pictures of that with Judah. So we have Judah the birthright. We see that brought forth. We had Reuben who was unstable as water passed over. We had Simeon and Levi who were hot-headed and self-willed and passed over. Then we have Judah who wasn't perfect by any stretch. <laughs> but yet, God chose and God set up for the coming of Messiah. We're going to get into a couple that are, that are difficult to deal with. The, the son of commerce, I, I didn't know what else to do. We just will read it. We'll look. Zebulun. And, and again, something interesting here. If you'll go back and you'll study, Jacob does not deal with them in birth order. Doesn't it kind of make sense if we... Now, he did the first four, but he gets to Zebulun, and Zebulun is way down the list. I mean, I don't have it written out for it, but I, I have my office. But uh, that was something I thought was interesting. We got to study in that. You would think if Jacob was going to talk to all of his boys, he'd start at the oldest, and he'd work his way all the way down to the youngest. Well, he doesn't do that. I mean, what was his favorite? Favorite, 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 favorite. Well, you know, but he, but he starts with Reuben. He does start with his firstborn, and he goes in order, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Joseph would have been his favorite, or Benjamin, you know, either one of them. But then he gets to, to Zebulun, and he, and he just, he, he goes... I, and I don't know. I don't understand why. I wish I had all the answers. I got a big, I got a big book in my office. I don't know. I was just going to make a joke. I got a big book in my office, and I'm writing all these questions down. When I get to heaven, I'm going to get it out and say, okay, Lord, I, I, mean, I got some questions. You know, by the time I get to heaven, I'm not going to care about all those questions. But this is what I don't have an answer to. All right? So we see in verse 13, and we just get one verse about, uh, about Zebulun. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea. He shall be for an haven of ships, and his breath and his border shall be undesired. That, that's his that's his statement to Zebulun. So we don't know a whole lot about Zebulun. We, we don't have a whole lot of history about him either. There's just not a lot said. So as we look at in this, his name means dwelling, and, and here, here we'll get his name. Uh, Genesis 30 and verse 20. And, and God now. Quite possibly, and I just saw that, but quite possibly he's dealing with, we'll have to look at the next one, dealing with the sons of Leah first. That, that might be the order that he went through. I didn't even think about that until just now. But he may have dealt with each group, each set of, cho uh, of children. I, that just don't know me. And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. He called his name Zebulun. Well, I mean, that's six. We had four. So I still have one. I don't know. Okay, see, I'm just trying to think something out of it all. So there you, now you leave. And one thing you can leave, one thing you can leave this class now and say, put your dog away with me. You know, all right. <clears throat> his name means dwelling. She said, now my husband, now will my husband dwell with me. And, and the idea is that she's won him, that, that, that he'll, she'll be his favorite. Now, we did mention this last week. Week or week before last, when when Israel died, where did they bury him? They buried him with Leah. Rachel was his favorite. She was dead. Well, but, but they buried him with Leah. That's that's just an interesting, interesting thought. All right. So she said, "Dwell now, now he may dwell with me." But then he talks about this in uh, in verse thirteen. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea. Now, just the idea of a strategic dwelling, he's talking about, and that's why I said the son of commerce, uh, because we're going to see with Zebulun, uh, his position, where he lives, and what he does, opens really opens up the world to the nation of Israel. Uh, very strategic dwelling, uh, talked about there. Uh, at the haven of the sea, uh, and he shall be a haven of ships, right? So it talks about, uh, the, the profitable dwelling here that he's going to be it's just a place of commerce. Ships coming in, trade going in and out, uh, and his border shall be undesired. So it, it, there seems to be some type of connection uh, with this idea of shipping 
of trade and of commerce. Not much more said about Zebulun. And we don't know a whole lot about the boy uh, other than what's given here. All right? Uh, so, again, I told you some of these are going to be a lot harder than the others to deal with. The next one, and, and we'll finish up with this one. We've got a few minutes. Because I, I, I almost messed up on this one. Number five is the son who couched down. And that's rough. That's not a, a, mis, a, a, a typo. I almost messed up and put the wrong word in here. The son who couched down. And we're talking about Issachar in Genesis 49, verse 14. It says, Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. The word I almost put in there was crouching. That's so when I first read it. That's what I read. So we got to be careful. I almost broke one of my, one of my, one of my statements that I say all the time. We read carefully and we read slowly. Because I almost did. I, as a matter of fact, the first line I put in here, it said, the son that crouched down. I got to read that again. I read over it and I realized it does not say crouched. It says couched. And this is the second time that word's been used that we've read tonight, uh, today already. Uh, but look at what it says. Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. And he saw the rest and he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. The son who couched down. His name literally means reward. And again, we'll read Genesis 30 and verse number 18. The Bible says this, and Leah said, back to Leah, God hath given me my hire because I have given my maiden to my husband. And she called his name Issachar. Now, this was not Leah's child. This was Leah's handmaiden's child. Uh, but uh, we see that, that she says that, that she has uh, a reward uh, for uh, what she has done now and all that. But anyway, all right. So as we look at Issachar, we'll find some very interesting statements about him. Uh, Issachar, number one, there's proclaimed strength. There's potential. There's possibility. Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. There, there's an opportunity for him to be very useful. That there's an opportunity for him to be used of the Lord and serve very well. However, there's a problem. And the problem is that we're couching down. I have to look at that word couching down and, and trying to figure out what that meant. And what that word means is to recline or to rest, to lay, to get on the couch. Couch potato, we can say that. That would be lazy. Right? And we see that as we read in verse 15. And he saw that rest was good. He had great potential, but he didn't have the character to go along with. And because his character was not good, he saw that rest was good. Now, now look at this. Here's what happens when you, when you rest, when you stop, when you just sit down. Now, I'm not talking about resting because you're tired and you need a break. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about characteristic laziness. There are always problems that come from that. And he saw that rest was good. And the land that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder to bear. The idea of this is that he did just enough to get by. <clears throat> he was there. He showed up. He did his job. But he did just enough to get through. We used to. Doesn't that bother you when folks do that? We used to have a little saying that place where I worked in Mississippi. You know, we used to thank folks for, you know, allowing us to do their job for them uh, because a lot of times you'd end up doing that. But it bother you when, when, when you've got to do somebody else's job and they're getting paid to do it? Yeah. Well, how many times do we see that same principle carried forth in the work of the Lord? 
You know, I, statistics. Statistics show that 20% of the church does 80% of the, uh, uh, of the work in the church. That, I mean, that's just, that's just an average. And if you look at it, that's normal the way it works. Which is unfortunate. If you, the more people you could get enlisted and involved in the thing, I mean, preacher, this is Sunday school. We came early. I thought, I, I, I said, I'm just giving you a principle. Pray about it. Pray about our church. Our church is that way. You realize a couple weeks ago we had 86 on Sunday morning. And I don't remember the exact number on Sunday, Sunday night, but it was probably 50 or 60 on Sunday night. Well, that's 30 people. Where'd they go? See, so what we've got to do, we're going to fuss about them. No, I'm not fussing about them. I'm just saying what we've got to do is we've got to continue to pray and to work and seek to reach them and enlist them and, and, and gain them because they don't understand this principle that the more, the more they forsake the strength that God gave them, the more susceptible they're going to be to the end of the story. What's the end of the story? A removal of their strength. What did he say? Bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. You'll find that Issachar in the history of the nation did not drive out the, 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 the inhabitants of the land and eventually Issachar became servants to those they left in the land. So what, we, we, what we've got to do is we have got to make sure that when God gives us opportunity, that we recognize that opportunity, we don't forsake that opportunity, that we don't lose that opportunity. All right, so we're going to stop with boy number four, or, or number four, actually, well, actually boy number five, but we're going to stop with Zebdi, uh, well, with this, it's, it's a car. It's a car. And uh, uh, we'll stop with him and, and uh, pick up there next week. All right. And, and I, I, I almost apologize. I don't know any other way to do this. It's kind of hard to get this history without it just getting bogged down. I'm trying not to do that. All right. Let's pray. We'll dismiss the service, uh, dismiss to, to the main service. Father, again, we're thankful for the day. What a joy it's been just to be able to be in your house. I pray that you'll bless, uh, that you'll be with the service this morning, that you'll give us exactly what we need. Father, looking forward to uh, what you have for us. Help us to recognize the opportunity to seize that day uh, and to do and serve you as you lead us. We love you in Jesus' name. Are you in the water though? No, I'm good. I'm going to fill your cup up. <laughs>